We thought we could mark these 50 years by inviting a few of the writers whose work has meant a lot to us and our readers to recall something they wrote for us and, if they want, say something about how it seems now. John Banville. It's one of the qualities of a great literary journal to be unimpressed by reputations. Reputation is easily come by, especially in these days when the cult of celebrity is so pervasive, appear more than three times on television, even with egg on your face, even with handcuffs on your wrists, and the goddess of fame is bound to print her mark upon your brow. A responsible editor must take note of contemporary and temporary fixations. I note a review in a recent uh, New York review of Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> but he will also always be ready to consider the overlooked, the underappreciated, the obscure. Mark Danner. The bravest thing I've ever done uh, it was one day when Bob was having a colloqu colloquy, I think, with the Israeli ambassador, I believe. I couldn't see Bob. I could see the man who he was talking to. This man started to gesture suddenly. Bob was serenely talking about the Middle East. This man started to gesture in panic. I looked over to the waste paper basket that was habitually piled with galleys and papers, and I saw flames rising to the ceiling. <laughs> And I have never done anything more courageous, not in Iraq, not in Haiti, not Bosnia, not anywhere, than stand up and with stately sort of glacial comp composure walk over to the waste paper basket, lift it up as if I did it every day, and carry it, uh, carry it from the room. So I truly, my real credit here is I saved the New York Review uh, and saved Bob Silvers. I will take credit for that. Darrell Pinkney. Baldwin's loss of his cool was a subject I thought I thought a lot about when, in 1979, Robert Silvers and Barbara Epstein suggested that I try to write about what would be his last novel. Just above my head is a sprawling saga about a black gay gospel singer and his family. I am embarrassed three decades later by the knowingness of that review from the typewriter of Mr. Little Shit. <laughs> I was young, Baldwin was young no longer, and therefore I had his number. Mary McCarthy advises that a good way to get started as a writer is to publish reviews. I was going about the business of trying to become a writer, willing to do so at the expense of this tender, brave, and brilliant soul. A few years later, at a party for Baldwin after he read his blues poems at the Y, I, drunk, asked, yes, asked if he'd seen that review. <laughs> he graciously said no. <laughs> and I'm afraid I can't pretend that I did not, in a seizure of self-importance, rehearse some of my arguments against his book right there in the middle of a cocktail party for him, this adored figure. His smile was all forbearance and understanding. He had my number. Joan Didion. One reason the victim in this case, the jogger case, could be so easily abstracted and her situation so readily made to stand for that of the city itself was that she remained as a victim of rape, unnamed in most press accounts. Although the American and English press convention of not naming victims of rape derives from the understandable wish to protect the victim, the rationalization of this special protection rests on a number of doubtful, even magical assumptions. Daniel Mendes.
The release of Catherine Bigelow's Zero Dark Thirty was greeted almost immediately by a controversy over how accurately the film represented the US government's use of torture in the pursuit of Osama bin Laden. A controversy, given the picture's claims to a journalistic scrupulousness, that has raised larger questions about the relationship between entertainment and journalism, reality and dramatization, facts and fiction. Michael Chabon. Before my association with the review began, I was a reader who set his course by the star of the paper. And now I set my course as a writer by its singular steady light. I never write a piece of nonfiction now without asking myself as I'm writing it, I wonder what Bob is going to make of this one. Mary Beard. Susan Sontag compared our reading of Simone Weil to Alcibiades' relationship with Socrates. I still haven't quite got that one, but it's, it was inspired. Um, <laughs> Robert Lowell likened the tombs outside Buenos Aires to one-roomed Roman temples. Dwight MacDonald compared Arthur Schlesinger to Virgil. <laughs> and in his memoir of Robert Frost, Lowell reminded us that Frost slept with a copy of the poems of Catullus on his bedside table. Now, whether such themes will resonate in the New York Review of Books when it comes to celebrate its centenary... I'm afraid that most of us here won't be around to see, but I am hopeful and pretty confident that they will. Thank you. Thank you.